Good morning. I feel very guilty about interrupting your conversations. Um, a couple of sort of minor admin things. Um, people have told me that not everyone's cataract operations were as successful as mine. And uh, therefore, it's not always visible from the back. We, I have had this sheet uh, printed out, and so there is now a handout with this tree on it. And uh, I think it's at the, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's at the back there, in a box, if you could take it uh, on your way out. I'm sorry you won't have it for today, but it'll be here for the next couple of days. Um, the uh, couple of other things, one is that, um, as you may have seen from the film program uh, today, I think at 11, uh, there's a film of Catherine the Great, uh, a documentary film, um, which of course I hope will support and uh, confirm some of the things I'm saying today. Uh, and then, uh, for those people that uh, have expressed an interest in the notes, in the sort of booklet, uh, they are on sale at the bookshop on the bay, the one in the central atrium, uh, after, from any time after this lecture. And uh, I'm very keen not to have to take any copies back home with me. So uh, remember, they're a wonderful present to give your family. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I do share the proceeds with Shawco, which I think is an absolutely wonderful, unique UCT institution. Um, right, and then there's just a normal reminder about the... Right. And then there's just a normal reminder about the telephones. Um, I'm sure you don't need any reminders, but... No harm in saying a few redundant things. Right. I'm going to start today with some quite complicated geneal genealogical details. So uh, it doesn't really matter whether you sort of follow every step of it. Uh, but if you can see the board, or if you have got a handout, it might be helpful. I rather like family trees. I find them quite fascinating. Um, and uh, uh, this one is particularly interesting. So uh, I make no apology for spending a few minutes looking at it this morning. Now, you may remember that Peter the Great died in dramatic circumstances leaving the fate of the throne sort of literally hanging in the air. And uh, uh, you know, here's a portrait of him on his deathbed. Now here is a French portrait painter who's come to Russia to seek his fortune. And uh, almost the first thing that happens to him is that Peter dies. Well, at least it gives him an opportunity to paint Peter on his deathbed. Uh, and that uh, ended when Peter, um, you know, this sort of a vacuum ended with the succession passing to Peter's second wife, and uh, who since her marriage had been styled Catherine. And so, sorry. Yeah. Right. So here we've got, uh, where are we? Peter. Okay, this is his second wife, Catherine. Do you remember? She was the illiterate Lithuanian peasant um, whom he'd more or less bought in an auction after a war, and uh, she stayed with him, or he stayed with her for the rest of her, of her, her life, or his life. Um, and interestingly, there was no prejudice against um, female rule in Russia. And in fact, for the 18th century, Russia was ruled by empresses for about 70 of the 100 years of the uh, 18th century. But female rule wasn't supposed to disrupt 
traditional male dominance. It was supposed to facilitate it, if anything. Um, and Catherine, Catherine the First, um, she was very much in that mold. She had been promoted to that position by a sort of uh, cabal of palace uh, nobles, and she very much relied on them for the two years that she was on the throne. After two years, she dies, either of tuberculosis or alcoholism. Uh, we're not quite sure. Um, and they've now got to look around for a successor to her. Well, the best hope at this stage is Peter II. Can you all see? Does this little thing show up? Yeah. And Peter II, as you can see, is the son of Peter's son, Alexis. Do you remember the one whom he may have strangled him, himself? Uh, but this boy is now the last, really, the last surviving Romanov. Um, and when he becomes Tsar uh, at the age of 12, uh, contemporary accounts express great disappointment that he showed little interest in administration or politics. Um, not quite sure what's expected of a 12-year-old. But in other ways, he must have been a precocious child because at the age of 14, he was apparently only interested in hunting women and alcohol. <laughs> but at the age of 14, he too died, either of smallpox or of poisoning. Uh, probably we'll never know the answers to most of these questions. And so the result of this is that there are actually no male Romanovs left. And, but you remember, Peter the Great had had a half-brother called Ivan. Do you remember that? And here is Ivan, okay? And he had married, and he'd actually produced five, or put it this way, the marriage produced five daughters, um, many of whom, some of whom may possibly have even been his own. And searching around for a successor to Peter, the boyars now choose Anna, the fourth of his daughters, as the next empress. Do you all see that? So here we have her. And uh, she had made a good diplomatic marriage at the age of 17 to another 17-year-old who was the Duke of Courland. And they'd had a celebrity lifestyle wedding in St. Petersburg, including huge pies from which dwarves leapt out, before setting off for Courland to take up their duties. On the journey, the Duke died. Again, probably from alcohol poisoning. But Anna and the Duke's corpse keep going, and she goes on to rule the Duchy of Courland for 20 years. And uh, here she is, um, looking sufficiently imperial. And you'll see from your family tree, from the family tree, that she was Empress of Russia for 10 years before she died at the age of 47 from kidney failure. However, she had taken the precaution of earmarking a successor, as she was entitled to do by the law that Peter had passed. And... Uh, the successor she nominates is the two-month-old son, two-month-old son, Ivan. Let's go back to the tree again. The two-month-old son, uh, okay, and he is the son of her elder sister, Catherine, who has already died, and, uh, but he is the nearest relative to her on that side of the family. And so she nominates him as the next Tsar, and he's crowned Ivan VI. However, Anna's reign had been disliked because of its pro-German attitudes, and Ivan's regency, which might last 15, 16 years at least, threatened to prolong that. So, this 
didn't sit well with the Russians in the 1740s. And there happens to be a good pro-Russian candidate available, and that is Elizabeth. And she is the only surviving daughter of, not quite sure why this, uh, here we are. Uh, and where are we, um, Elizabeth, here we are. And she is the only surviving daughter out of the 12, you remember, that uh, Peter and Catherine had had. She's the only surviving child. And uh, once again, there's an army-backed coup in her favor, and little Ivan and his parents were bundled off to a lifetime of imprisonment. And uh, that's another, that's the uh, close-up of the same portrait of, Ivan, of Anna, which you saw a moment ago. And here we have Elizabeth, uh, the daughter of Peter the Great. And uh, Elizabeth was a larger-than-life character in every sense of the word and a, a unique place in Russian history which has earned the affections of historians ever since is that in her reign, for the only time in Russian history, not a single execution took place. So this is an unusual and, distinction, uh, and distinctive achievement. But she too produces no heirs. She had been... Uh, betrothed to another German prince, but he had died before the wedding, and uh, for, for I'm not quite sure why, she never seems to have found another man or another suitable suitor, uh, and so she does not have any heirs. But her older sister, going back to this tree again, her older sister, um, Anna, had made a marriage to the Duke of Holstein Gottorp, okay? And Holstein Gottorp, you know where Holstein is? Holstein is the, is the province on the base of the Danish peninsula. And so uh, Holstein Gottorp was an even sort of subgroup of the Duchy of Holstein. Uh, but Holstein was still a duchy with some kind of clout in European affairs. And the marriage to the Duke of Holstein got up was thought to be a good marriage. And she had had a son. She died in childbirth, Anna. But her son, Peter, okay, uh, Elizabeth invites Peter now to come to Russia to be groomed to be the next emperor. And once she was installed, or once he was installed in St. Petersburg, she looks around for a suitable wife for him. And she installs or she summons the daughter of a very minor, impoverished German princeling. He was so poor that he even had to enroll in Frederick the Great's army as an officer in order to support his family. And she invites the daughter of this princeling to come to Russia to be the wife to her nephew. Is all this making sense? because you know, it's, quite, it's quite convoluted in its way. And for Princess Sophia of Anhalt Zerbst, this was like winning the lottery. <laughs> Conditional on very good behavior. And uh, behaving well at, Eli at Elizabeth's court uh, was a slightly tricky business. You had to stay very much on the right side of her. So, here we have Sophia of Anhalt Zerbst by Karavak again, and that's what she may have looked like. In fact, what she did look like, because Karavak was painting from life, and that's what she did look like at the age of 15. So, Sophia resolved to behave very well. And she immediately started to learn Russian, and she converted from Lutheranism to the Russian Orthodox Church which in neither of which, incidentally, her husband, Peter, had bothered to do when he was summoned to Russia to be groomed to, the next, to be the next emperor. And when she married Peter, she took the name Catherine, very tactfully, in honor of Elizabeth's mother. Okay? So she's made all the right moves to start with. And Sophia, we know an awful lot about Sophia or Catherine, as we will now call her. 
because she was an indefatigable letter writer and memoirist. And she wrote her life story about seven times in at least four different languages. Um, and today she would have been blogging and tweeting night and day. She was you know, that sort of person. Um, and according to her memoirs, it was made clear to her that her chief purpose was to provide an heir. And allegedly, according to her, the child's parentage was not paramount. The important thing, any child, would be enough to consolidate her position at court. And in 1754, she gave birth to a boy who was christened Paul. And rumors about his parentage have been rife ever since. But the general consensus now is that Peter was, in fact, his likeliest father. However, whether that's true or not, it was a desperately unhappy marriage, the fault, according to Catherine, of Peter's maladjusted and retarded personality, which I think probably was the case, and uh, he certainly was a very strange young man. And when the Empress Elizabeth died in 1762, Catherine's husband becomes Peter II. And here he is. Uh, he's, only, he's about 30 at this stage, but he, for some reason or other, he looks about 90. Um, <laughs> and you would imagine that this would have been a great step for Peter. But funny enough, Peter's interests lay elsewhere. He wasn't interested in becoming the Tsar of Russia. What he was obsessed about was gaining for the Duchy of Holstein Gottorp the lost province of Schleswig. Okay, can you see what we're talking about? And that really was the great fixation of his life. Here's the Duchy of Holstein. At one stage, it had been linked to the Duchy of Schleswig. It had lost that duchy. It, Peter uh, now wants to retrieve it. And he immediately started to make preparations for a war, which, of course, the Russians would have to fund. And added to his other pro-German policies, this was too much for the court. And after a reign of six months, another army-backed coup deposed Peter in favor of his wife. Um, and uh, all the films about Catherine, and possibly the documentary today, start with a very glamorous episode where she appears in front of the pro brzezinski and the Zemanovsky guards and says, you know, Russia is being sold down the river, help me to bring it back again. And uh, they say, yes, we'll follow you, and uh, they more or less put Peter under house arrest. Uh, that, well, they put him under house arrest initially, and a week later, mysteriously, he dies. And the cause of death was officially given as, and this is the official notice, hemorrhoidal colic. Um, no one had heard of this before, but a prominent French philosopher immediately cancelled a planned trip to Russia because he said he suffered from piles. <laughs> and Peter's body was put on display to prevent future false claimants. Now, that was a very common feature of Russian history, that if somebody uh, wanted to pretend that they had a claim to the throne, they would claim to be the reincarnation of some murdered or dead prince uh, and they want to make quite clear that there's no possibility that that can happen by putting his dead body on display. So that sounds good. But there was a cravat covering his throat and he was almost certainly strangled. Whether with or without Catherine's knowledge will never be known. One last point before we look at Catherine's reign in detail. Uh, I've said several times in the course of the last two days <coughs> how extraordinary it is that the Romanovs managed to scrape through to the 20th century. Not once, but many times. I mean, this dynasty has hung on by the skin of its teeth, you know, to power. And by, according to Western custom, uh, by Catherine's time, and in fact no one had a weaker claim to be a Romanov than Catherine, they were no longer Romanovs at all. And when her husband became Tsar, 
by the reckoning of most Western monarchies, in fact, by the British monarchy or the French monarchy or the Spanish monarchy, this would have marked a change of dynasty. And they would have now become the House of Holstein Gottorp. Does that make sense to everyone? And uh, that should have been the case. And apparently what most enraged the 19th century czars was if you referred to them as the House of Holstein Gottorp. So although we always talk about Nicholas and Alexandra as the last of the Romanovs, the direct line in one sense had come to an end 150 years previously. Okay. So when Catherine becomes empress, although she was only, or although only 38 years had elapsed since the death of Peter the Great, in that time there had been six changes of czar, and that makes the situation sound pretty unstable. But in fact, in those 38 years, the international situation had changed substantially in Russia's favour. And as implied yesterday, the Swedish meteor burnt itself out with the death of Charles XII. And the next potential threat on the western border was the so-called Commonwealth of Poland. And at the beginning of the 17th century, this had stretched from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Can you all see? This was by far the largest state in Europe west of Russia. The next map may, well, that's just dividing it into its provinces. But you can see the extent over which this enormous state spreads. And Poland's powerful army had been vital in defeating the Turks at Vienna in 1683. And in fact, the Poles had been a powerful force in Europe. But in the 18th century, the Polish state was in decline, which was less obvious at the time than it has been subsequently. And the basic problem was that what was called the Commonwealth of Poland was a sort of potpourri of Poles, Lithuanians, Ukrainians, Jews, Germans, and Balkan peoples. And the constitution of the Polish state undermined the authority of the central government to weld these different components together. It's a complicated story, and I'm not going to get off the topic by talking about it now. The third great threat on Russia's western border was the Ottoman Empire, which for centuries had been the bane of Christian Europe and, of course, the target of nine crusades, as you all know. And it had been the predominant military power in the eastern Mediterranean since the 13th century. And here it is in 1672, I mean, of course, at one stage, of course, the uh, Arab peoples had advanced across the Straits of Gibraltar into Spain, in fact, even across the Pyrenees. Now we're going on to 1672, but it's still an enormous space. Um, and that, for many, many years, had been the kind of target of all, uh, you know, Western diplomacy. But for reasons too complicated to go into now again, the Ottoman Empire was also in steep decline by the mid 16th, uh, sorry, 18th century. And the basic problem with the Ottoman Empire, just to simplify it in one sentence, was that the ethnic Turks constituted too small a proportion of the total population of the empire. Now, for a very long time, the Swedes, the Poles, and the Turks could all count on the support of the French who, as you know, like to support everything that anyone else is against. And they supported any state which would weaken their most dangerous enemy, the Habsburg Empire. However, by the mid-18th century, the French were losing ground too. They were on the losing side of all three of the great wars of the 18th century, and they paid a heavy price for that territorially and financially. So, without Russia having had to do very much at all to assert its interests, the international situation had changed significantly to its advantage. Does that all make sense? In other words, the Russians didn't have to push anything or press anything or do anything. The international situation had just sort of worked out to its advantage. However, I mean, that sounds as though I'm belittling, you know, what is about to come next. 
It's one thing to have a favorable international climate and another to turn it to one's advantage. And I think that was really Catherine's great strength, that she turned this favorable situation to Russia's advantage. Now, in 1768, the Turks invaded what we would today call the Ukraine in the expectation of French support. Um, and what was at stake was the northern shore of the Black Sea. Can you all see where I'm talking about? Uh, tell me if you ever want me to use this little thing. Um, and, uh, and the important feature about that, of course, are the river mouths that give out onto the Black Sea. Control of those is very important. And Catherine concentrated her efforts on reviving Peter the Great's navy, which had been rather neglected since his death. And the new fleet won a famous victory at Kesme in the Aegean. And the medal struck to commemorate the victory simply said, I was there. And Catherine commissioned a new church in St. Petersburg, which you may have seen, to commemorate the triumph. And uh, this is a typical piece of Russian architecture. I mean, it's the boldness and the extravagance of these buildings is just breathtaking. And for the Russians, it was the first lesson in the intricacy of European politics, because although they'd been fighting against the Turks for 500 years, now that the Turks were on the run, the European powers did not want to see Turkey wiped off the map simply for Russia's benefit. So they now rushed to Turkey's aid. And Russia had to give back her gains in the Crimea. But in exchange, they win land in Poland shared between the Austrians and the Prussians. We'll come back to this point in a minute. But Russia did win two significant concessions from the war with the Turks. And the first was that the peace treaty stated that the Crimea was now independent. In other words, it was not under Turkish protection any longer. And the second was that Russia was given the right to intervene on behalf of the Christians in the Ottoman Empire. Now, that's a pretty sort of open-ended sort of uh, in, uh, uh, encouragement to intervene. And those two clauses really meant that the Crimea, in fact, had a sort of delayed death sentence. Seven years later, Catherine and her enforcer in southern Russia, Grigory Potemkin, judged the time right to ramp up the diplomatic pressure. And Potemkin, I've deliberately hardly said anything about Potemkin, but Potemkin is a absolutely another even larger than larger than life character. And I noticed that on the book shelves there's a book by Montefiore called Catherine and Potemkin. And it's a great story <laughs> about two people, neither of whom I care for much. But, um, you know, they do achieve in their way something quite considerable. Um, and the Khan of the Crimean Tatars had survived an internal revolt only with Russian help. And the Russians now claimed that his government was a cause of dangerous instability in the area. And they offer him a handsome bribe to abandon his kingdom. He puts up no resistance, and the Crimea was annexed to, Turkey, uh, to Russia as the Tauride Peninsula. And so here you can see 1783, uh, it becomes annexed to Russia as the Torid or Tauride Peninsula. And why it was given that name was because that was the name that the Greeks had known it by. And what Catherine wants to do is to sort of link, you know, this development with ancient European civilization. She doesn't want to give it um, an Asiatic name, le let alone a Muslim name. So after so many centuries of conflict, it had all been anticlimactically easy, but Catherine was euphoric. She wrote in gushing terms to Potemkin. She created him the Prince of Tauride, and she gave him an award of 100,000 rubles. And you might ask, where does she get all this money from? The point where the Russian uh, royal family get his money from is that they owned 17 million acres of land in Russia. And many of, much of it may not have been very productive. 
But what it amounted to was a huge income which other European uh, royalty would have given their back teeth for. So the Russian royal family has money um, which no other royal family in Europe has at the time. Um, and uh, this advance to the Crimea was a huge strategical stride for Russian diplomacy. And the rest of Europe have no doubt in which direction it's heading. And can you see this? Here on the left you see Russia, on the right you can see Constantinople. And that's what everybody fears that all this sort of activity is aimed at. And of course the Russians had had their eye on Constantinople for centuries as being potentially a warm water port. Um, now Potemkin's greatest and longest lasting achievement was to follow up the annexation of the Crimea with a constructive administration. And his biggest undertaking was the creation of a Black Sea fleet. And at, its de at his death in 1791, it numbered 27 battleships, making it the second largest fleet in Europe. But Potemkin did more than anyone to change the face of southern Russia. He scoured Europe for productive settlers often groups who had been rejected by everybody else. Albanians, Greeks, old believers, they are a group of Russian Orthodox adherents who believe in a rather outdated form of the sort of church ritual. A61 Corsican families, 880 Swedes, 1,200 Mennonites from the Baltic, Moldovans, Wallachians, British convicts, diverted from Australia. Everybody was welcome. Even Jews, as he wrote to his agents, often quoted by biographers as evidence of his unusual liberalism. And he moved so many settlers into so-called New Russia that its population doubled in eight years. He offered land grants an exemption from taxation for 10 years. He offered loans to start businesses. He built garrisons to reassure settlers that their initiative would be adequately protected. And today's southern Russian population uh, is the product of this extraordinary ethnic mix. He built new cities in the Crimea, Sebastopol, Mikolaev, Odessa. And by 1787, he felt confident enough to encourage Catherine to pay a state visit to her new acquisitions. Now, Catherine's six-month tour of the Crimea has quite properly entered the realm of legend. It was partly designed to advertise Russia's claim to the new territories, partly to impress foreign observers, and partly to allow Catherine and Potemkin to indulge in an orgy of mutual congratulations. The party travel on seven gold and scarlet galleys, each of which was sumptuously hung in gold and silk and even had its own orchestra. There was a grand dining barge and the galleys even had flushing toilets, which was a luxury almost unknown in most houses. And they were followed by a flotilla of 80 boats carrying 3,000 troops and baggage and munitions. And almost the most famous feature of this journey are the so-called Potemkin villages, does the name ring a bell, where Potemkin is alleged to have erected fake facades and herded spurious crowds in order to impress the emperors. However, as people say, you can well believe that Potemkin villages weren't necessary to pack the river banks with spectators as this astonishing procession glided past. On the journey, the King of Poland, another of Catherine's former lovers, joins the party under the name Count Poniatowski to preserve the fiction that Polish kings were not allowed to leave Poland. And two weeks after that, they were joined by the lugubrious Emperor Joseph II, the Austrian Emperor, whose alliance and good impressions were one of the prime purposes of the journey. And here he is. He's one of my favorite historical characters. He had his tombstone inscribed with the words, Here lies Joseph II, 
who failed in everything he undertook. <laughs> I like people who play down their achievements. He kept a detailed account of the journey. They all kept detailed accounts of the journey. And at the new capital of Kherson, they laid the foundation stones of a new cathedral. Joseph gloomily said, Catherine laid the first stone and I the last. In May, the entourage arrived and installed itself at Bakisarai, the capital of the Crimean Tartars. And here's Bakisarai Palace, uh, I think there's another, yeah, um, modeled on the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, a sort of slightly miniaturized version of it. Um, and this spectacle stunned all observers, but Joseph commented, here we are lodged between the minarets and the mosques, where they shout, pray, sing, and spin around on one foot five times a day. <laughs> but his talkative pessimism doesn't alienate Catherine. At least he's not a pea soup, she said. And they reviewed the Black Sea fleet at Sebastopol, where Catherine wrote, all this so strongly resembles the dreams of the thousand and one nights that one does not know if one is awake or dreaming. Now, it's tempting to mock the hubris of Catherine and Potemkin's achievement, but the end result was, a much more <coughs> was much more than a public relations exercise. It created a new image for Russian autocracy, not the raw, pioneering, semi-Asiatic image of Peter the Great, but a new, cultured, refined, sort of westernized image of Catherine. And in 1789, the situation developed further in Russia's favor when the French Revolution broke out, confirming many people's opinions about the danger of tampering with autocratic monarchies. The Poles caught the bug, and they started to reform their constitution. Catherine destabilized that attempt by encouraging a pro-Russian group to break away from the Polish state. And the Prussians thought more was to be gained by cooperation than by resistance, and they collaborate in a second partition of Poland. And uh, in 1795, another Polish rising was squashed by the Russians, by the Russians, the Prussians, and the Austrians, in an attempt to preempt what they called the disease and madness of the French Revolution. And Europe watched in amazement as in the space of 20 years, the largest European state west of Russia was wiped off the face of the map. And so here are the three Polish uh, partitions. Um, the, the, pink ones, as you can, yeah, uh, the pink ones are the first partition which, as you can see, may have been justified to some extent by hiving off the Russian people or the Austrian people from the main group, but the rest are really just sort of naked expansionism. Um, and, uh, in fact, the three rulers agree that the word Poland will never be used again, uh, and that's how Poland simply disappears off the map. And during Catherine's reign, Russia gained over one million square miles, an area greater than South Africa. But what was important was not so much the quantity of land as the quality. And um, here we have, you know, in the sort of darker brown, lighter and darker brown colors, the lands gained in Western Europe or Western Russia during Catherine's reign. And these new lands are much better educated, they're more prosperous, more fertile, and more densely populated than any of the rest of Russia. And during her reign, the population of Russia increases from 23 million to 41 million. Um, well, at this time, the population of France, which was the largest state in Western Europe, was about 25 million, and the population of Britain was about 5 million. So a state of 41 million you know, now becomes a significant player. And the new acquisitions move Russia into the mainstream of world politics, as the Napoleonic Wars were soon to demonstrate. And in some ways, I've always felt that in both the Crimea and Poland, 
Catherine was sort of push, is getting credit for having been pushing at an open door. Neither state was in a position to offer any serious resistance, but her great achievement was to manipulate the European situation in such a way as to get away with it. So let's look at the sovereign who is credited with this expansion and who certainly gave herself the credit for it. Um, well, here she is in 1786 at the age of 55, um, and I notice with interest that um, a new sort of um, mini-series is being produced by Sky or by Netflix or something called Catherine the Great with Helen Mirren playing Catherine. Now, we all know Helen Mirren very slim, very sort of uh, petite. Uh, Catherine, of course, weighed something like 140 kilos you know, at her death. So uh, I'm not quite sure whether they're going to pad Helen up to this or whether we're just going to have to have a suspension of belief. Um, how does this very, how does this foreign-born, very minor princess present herself as the figurehead for an assertive national policy? Well, she came to power, you remember, with the help of an army coup. And at first, she relies heavily on the plotters who had brought her to power. And that was a man called Gregory Orloff and his brothers. And interestingly, one million rubles out of the annual state budget of 16 million were awarded to the plotters who helped her come to power. And the St. Petersburg garrison, which was crucial to the success of this enterprise, they were given half a year's salary as a gift for having supported her in this coup. And Catherine is always very generous with other people's money. Um, but Orlov was more than her chief advisor. Um, for 10 years, he was also her official consort. Now, he was only five years younger than she was, so in age terms, she was the best match, he was the best match she ever had. She expected the liaison to be permanent, but he deserted her for a 13-year-old cousin. <laughs> However, her affair with Orloff illustrates one of Catherine's great strengths. In spite of being another control freak, she was good at delegating. And her next great affair was with another army officer, Grigory Potemkin, uh, whom we spoke about earlier. He was 10 years younger than she was, so the age gap is beginning to widen. And their affair lasted only two years before he left her too to pursue affairs with each of his five nieces in turn. <laughs> but he stays on to become one of her most trusted advisors. And she had the same prime minister, for instance, for 30 of the 32 years uh, of her reign. She had the same private secretary for the last 20 years of her reign. I mean, these are very unusual figures in any sort of autocratic monarchy. Her private secretary came from a family of minor Ukrainian landlords, and that was good because they, uh, that means that they were dependent, in a sense, on her patronage. And uh, it was said of him, the British ambassador said of her private secretary, he concealed the most delicate mind in the most oafish envelope. Once arriving home after an orgy, Catherine demanded the overdue text of a document. He pulled out a piece of paper with a flourish and read out an exquisitely drafted decree. Catherine nodded and asked him to hand her the manuscript. He handed her a blank page and fell to his knees. <laughs> she forgave him. She had the same foreign minister for the first 20 years of, his, of her reign, in spite of frequently disagreeing with his advice. Generally speaking, people liked working for her, and they were lavishly rewarded for their loyalty. And she worked very hard, early to rise and early to bed. Time, she used to say, belongs not to me, but to the empire. And government, she said on another occasion, government is my métier. And everybody has commented on how boring life at her court was. You know, most nights of the year, uh, people settled down to play cards at about six o'clock, 
and she herself went to bed at about nine. So, you know, I'm interested to see what sort of a mini-series they're going to make out of this. <laughs> but they'll no doubt find something. Catherine was the contemporary of Frederick the Great of Prussia and the Emperor Joseph of Austria, and her dearest wish was to be regarded, like them, as an enlightened despot. And two years after taking the throne, she commissioned what was called a nakaz, a sort of inquiry into Russia's government and laws. It took three years to compile and was discussed at 204 sittings. And Catherine was present at most of these meetings behind a screen, and so she was available to be contacted while officially invisible. This is another little sort of gimmick like Peter's. And at least two-thirds of her nakaz was borrowed from the French philosopher Montesquieu. Um, its tone was liberal and humane. It became the talking point of Europe. But typically, after six months, the commission was disbanded without any new code having been enacted. Catherine claimed that it had served its purpose just by being openly discussed. Her supporters claimed it revealed what she herself called her Republican soul. And her detractors said it was a meaningless publicity exercise. And others said it was designed much more for foreign than for home consumption. Now, typically, Catherine made a great feature of being avidly interested in education. And her foundation of the Smolny Institute for Noble Girls is often quoted. She founded teacher training colleges and a Prussian-based system of free tuition with a secular curriculum and a ban on corporal punishment. It sounds enlightened enough, but when she died, 62,000 pupils were being educated by the state out of a population of 41 million. Um, in 1790, male literacy in Russia was estimated at about 4.5%. In France, at the same time, it was 47%. In England, it was 68%, and in Prussia, it was 80%. So education, really, I mean, in spite of all her you know, protestations to the contrary, has hardly moved at all. And no new university was founded after Empress Elizabeth founded the University of Moscow in 1757. Well, you might say, was there money available to do more? Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. The national health was another concern. Catherine heard of the London doctor, Thomas Dimsdale, who was practicing inoculation against smallpox. And she invited him to Russia to inoculate her and her son and heir, Paul. And at the same time, they laid on a relay of fast horses to speed him out of the country in case things went wrong. But her willingness to try something as dangerous and innovative as uh, as the inoculation was similar to Queen Victoria agreeing to try chloroform for childbirth in the next century. However, Dimsdale's treatment worked, and by 1800, two million Russians were believed to have inoculated, of course, at their own expense. By 1773, there was a very serious revolt in Russia, which acted as a wake-up call for Catherine's administration. And she responded with a system of local government which led the way to decentralization. And the root cause of the rebellion was a protest against serfdom. And Russian serfs had a situation not very different from the black slaves of the USA, except, of course, that they were of the same race as their masters. And Catherine made many pronouncements on the benefits of emancipating serfs, but enacted none of them. In fact, she increased the practice in order to bind the nobles most closely to her. And in 1785, for example, she rejected a proposal to emancipate the children born to serfs, which would have been possible, but she rejected it because it would have irritated her noble support. However, like Peter, who left behind the colossal legacy of St. Petersburg, Catherine also leaves behind an equally timeless legacy, and that, of course, is the Hermitage. The Winter Palace had been commissioned by the Empress Elizabeth 
from the architect Rastrelli, but Catherine turned one of its wings into an art gallery. Many of you will have seen it. Um, I would say when you go to the Hermitage, the real star of the Hermitage is the palace itself. It's an absolutely stunning building. This is the so-called Jordan Staircase, um, which uh, takes you up to the upper floors. Um, and uh, it's one of 140 staircases in the building. And her collection began in 1764 with a particularly satisfying coup. Frederick the Great of Prussia had commissioned a Berlin art dealer to buy him 225 old masters. But he spent so much money on an unsuccessful war against the Russians that he couldn't complete the sale. Instead, Catherine snapped them up. And from then on, she bought up any large collection that was offered for sale. She herself said, it's not love, it's veracity. I'm not a lover, I'm a glutton. And when she made a huge acquisition in 1781, she wrote gleefully, the purchase of the Bodin collection of paintings has made many collectors green with envy. And you can see, it's not the art she wants, it's the true collector's mania of stealing a march on the opposition. But it wasn't just paintings that Catherine squirreled away. She amassed a huge hoard of precious stones. Of one purchase, she wrote, four people carried two baskets containing half the collection. You can tell how greedy we've become. And she then turned her attention to cameos. And about 15 years ago, we attended in London an exhibition of 500 of her cameos. And these were, uh, you know, you know how big a cameo is. And uh, the 500 that were on display were the ones by either by famous artists or of famous subjects. But do you know how many cameos she could have had in her collection? 10,000. She could never, ever have looked at half of them. Um, she also liked porcelain dinner sets, and she acquired about a thousand of them. This is the very famous frog set that she commissioned from Wedgwood. And at the top, you can see uh, a little sort of frog. You know, every piece on it you know, has a little frog to decorate it. And they all are decorated with a picture of some Russian palace. In 1766, she rescued the French a philosopher Diderot from bankruptcy by buying his library. It became the first of many. But for me, the real condemnation of her collection is that it was never on view to the public. She once wrote, only I and the mice can enjoy all this. <laughs> the famous Hermitage Gallery, which many of you will have been to, was only opened in 1852, 60 years after her death. And all the while, remember, only 62,000 of Russia's children are being educated by the state. And she's just